Welcome to The Business Grind, where we give you an inside perspective on what it takes to start, build, and run a successful business. Here are your hosts, Danny Shaw and Sean Michael Wellington. All right. Hello to everyone in podcast land today. Thanks for joining us, Sean. How you feeling? Feeling good and ready to revisit a classic book. Yes, indeed. All right, so in today's episode, we're going to discuss the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. All right, so yeah, let's just jump right into it. So what inspired us to review this book that has been uh, promoted over all the channels and all the accounts on how to grow your business, if you wanted to want to get into business and you want to learn how to become, you know, scale and do all be successful why are we revisiting this book uh after so many years sean uh correct me if i'm wrong i think there was some controversial statements made by the <laughs> author that kind of brought it to the top of our uh consciousness and then uh we thought it'd be interesting to revisit this book with a new you know we've done similar you know we've done a lot of the building block books already we did think and grow rich and mm-hmm. things like that so we thought it would be interesting for us to tackle this right yeah for sure because i you know to, to the audience out there, this probably, if it wasn't for the recent statements by the author, I would have definitely kept moving. I would have not considered this book <laughs> for one of our show's episodes. Uh, but yeah, Robert Kiyosaki, the author, uh, it seems like, you know, he was making the news cycle circles recently by disclosing that he was over a billion dollars in debt, uh, which caused quite a lot of people to be surprised at that statement considering the success that he has had over the years with the Rich Dad Poor Dad series as well as his other ventures and and so forth right um I think yeah. you know the way he explain the way he explains it you know it it I it makes sense to him and for what he does you know and I think one of the quotes that was really uh highlighted was that you know if he fails, the bank fails. So he doesn't really feel pressured uh, to pay off that debt or to relieve himself of, of that debt anytime soon, right? Right. That was kind of his uh, his excuse for that <laughs> level of debt. Like, well, it ain't my debt, really. It's their debt. <laughs> it's <laughs> their debt. <laughs> you know, which is kind of interesting, kind of funny, but also it's kind of how a lot of people do business <laughs> and we see it all around us. You know, I think it would... It would be, um, it's one thing if he was the only one that kind of moved like this, but I, if anybody watches the, the headlines or any of the, you know, business news that has been happening with last five, ten, or just as long as you've been in business, you, we would know that this isn't really a new phenomenon, uh, but it is interesting considering uh, it's coming from him, you know, and considering what he promotes and talks about in his business uh, journey, right? Yeah, it is interesting. And to me, it almost feels a little consistent in terms of his mentality. Maybe not in the actual application of debt versus liability, right? But mm-hmm. or debt versus assets. But um the way he talked about not being fearful and not moving based on fear with your financial decisions and moving strategically, like it all kind of aligns with that. Oh, so. fair enough, fair enough. All right. So for the sake of that, you know, uh we decided to reread the book. Uh I haven't read this book in forever, but I do remember when I read it, it was at the time where there was a few books that just had the streets on lock in regards to, to business books and, and just self-help and motivation. This was one, I think one of the Robert Green books was hot at the time as well, The 48 Laws. Um, it was a few, Think and Grow Rich. Those Those foundational books at the time were just... You couldn't go anywhere without somebody just mentioning that they read one of those books as, a, as well as a few others. But it's been years uh, since I've read that book. Uh, so we thought it would be good just to revisit, see if the things still hold up, uh, revisit our initial thoughts about the book. Do we still feel the same way? And, and you know, would we recommend that to someone in, in 2024, right? Right, exactly. Right. So, Sean, when you read it way back when, do you remember your thoughts and how you felt about it when you read it back then? Yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I read it, I really enjoyed the the storytelling method of comparing mm. the two dads, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like, you know, most, at least most people who grew up in the Caribbean household or immigrant household kind of can relate a little bit to the frugalness of, of poor dad, even if you didn't necessarily grow up poor, but I feel like 
the frugality that he described is almost universal to certain Caribbean households. I don't know if you felt that way. So, all right. So, I, fair. I don't disagree with that. I think I I distinctly remember after reading that book, I was like, I don't get the hype. <laughs> that was that was. I'm not a hater. I, I promise, I'm not a hater. I just remember thinking, okay, this is a cool book, but I just couldn't understand why everybody was like, yo, you got to read this book. You got to read this book. And then when I read it, I, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, I knew this and that. Because it, it was things he was saying that I did not know for, I, I did not know. I, I wasn't aware of certain things. But I think when I left, when I finished reading that book, I left, I left kind of like, hmm, it felt very, it felt anti a lot of stuff. It felt like anti-education. It felt like anti- having Blue a collar yeah almost, and right? yeah it just felt like that and even though there was times in the book where you know he would put up the disclaimer like i'm not anti-education i'm not this i'm not that it's one thing to say it but then every time you give an anecdote to stories throughout the whole book right it's you still keep knocking it right and i i get it for the sake of the of the book for the sake of storytelling for the sake of you know marketing you have to have these maybe extremities, right? The rich dad and the poor dad and have these conflict and ideologies. But for me, when I when I finished the book, it wasn't like I thought anything was inherently wrong. There were some things I did think was like, I don't know about this, but my main takeaway was like, hmm, this is very anti everything. <laughs> Every It was capitalist, capitalism, capitalism, at all costs and forget you if you're trying to be educated and have a job uh you're, a, you're you're not worthy if um the nerve of you to be a union member the nerve of you to uh uh to want a union the nerve of you to look at government or even acknowledge government that's kind of just how i felt uh, you know the first that's time pretty around. accurate that's yeah. i mean capitalism is the driving factor in all of his motivation in this book, right? Mm -hmm. is serving that beast and mastering it, right? That's right. kind of what this is. So right, right. that totally fits in it. And he definitely, I mean, he, whether it's intentional or not, or whether it's malicious or not, he definitely discourages uh, anything that goes against that. Right, so. right, right. So that was the takeaway I, I got first time around. Now, uh, to people who may not have read this before, who have it in their uh, reading list to get to. Uh, I guess we should just first talk about the book and the gist of that first before we give our opinion from back then and now. Um, but, you know, the book essentially, it's the story of two dads that Robert Kiyosaki had. One was his biological father, the rich dad, and one was his, you know, adopted father or mentor, so to speak, which was his rich dad. And, you know, throughout the book is essentially multiple uh, anecdotal stories about his experiences growing up and getting lessons from both uh, fathers, whereas his uh, mentor father was more of the capitalistic uh, business father, and uh, his poor dad, his biological father, was uh, the educator, the one who worked for the government, the one who focused on you know, you know, be unionized, get a good job, and and you know. Uh, uh, blame quote unquote the government and other entities for when things don't go right and so throughout the book he's just given us multiple examples that teach a lesson so such as like we said sean you know um starting your own business uh stop starting your own business uh well, that's really one of the biggest ones tax advantages uh real estate scenarios to to set you up for future success uh, leveraging, you know, even leveraging debt. So I guess it makes sense that he is. Uh, it's him, yep. You know, um, certain tax shelters to consider, uh, you know, how to market, how to sell, uh, all these scenarios. And it, it's that's basically the, the beginning and, and end of this book. Multiple stories on how to become successful in business uh, told through the stories of what he was taught by his two fathers, all right? Right. And now I I know we want to we don't want to jump around too much, but I think one overall question I have for you was was there any piece of advice or any section that you completely disagreed with? Because I feel like there was one piece of advice that I was like, eh, this may apply to some, but not to me. 
I think, well, <clears throat> there's a few, and I don't have off the top of my head. I think uh, the theme, there was, there's a theme, and not just with him, you know, there's a theme with a lot of people, I feel, a lot of successful business people, um, that once they become successful, they seem to develop this attitude of, well, if I did it, you should all be able to do it, and the nerve of you for not being able to do it, and the nerve of you for uh, requesting or, or or requiring some sort of help, right? Uh, and it wasn't explicitly stated, but like I said, with all the themes that go on in this book, it's definitely a big undertone, and that that I see that in a lot of scenarios, not just him. Um, and it makes sense, right? Once you're in a new circle, once you're in new brackets, once you're in a new arena that you're trying to survive in, you you start taking out your frustrations on what's annoying you. And then for a lot of businesses, it is government, it is taxes, it is this, it is that. And it is, you know, you start even going after your employees who want, you know, certain working conditions. You know what I mean? It's like, these are the conditions that allowed you to be successful. Now that you are successful, now you, you know, you turn around and everything's wrong with the system. You're mad at the taxes. You're mad at this. You're mad at the employees. You're, how dare you want to change conditions in X, Y, and Z. And that's kind of the thing that I didn't necessarily agree with. You know, it's not like he just said, I mean, I'm sure there's other things that I will remember as we talk through this, but that's kind of what kind of nudged me or made me feel a, a certain way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the reason I asked is because, um, again, without skipping around too much, right. you know, keep keep some flow to this. But mm -hmm. um, when he, the advice he gave about, um, well, <clears throat> the advice the rich dad gave about know a lot about know a, a little bit about a lot of things, mm -hmm. and the educated dad, as he called them, the poor dad was kind of like be a specialist, master be a master of something, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So you have one guy advocating for jack of all trades, master of none, the other advocating for being a specialist. I kind of tend to lean into the specialist, right? And believe that, at least for me personally, I feel like knowing, being a specialist is very valuable, I feel like. I don't know. So that that was just one piece of advice that I was like, I don't I think this applies to everyone in every industry. Absolutely, so. right. Okay, so being a specialist, got it. Anything mm -hmm. else? That, I mean, that was just the one that stood out to me from the book that I was like, I don't subscribe to this particular piece of advice, though I understand why you're saying it. Right. I think, so I've always been on, the specialist versus generalist conversation has always like been around since I first got into this space. I really, again, it goes back to depends, right? Especially, I believe in, you can be a specialist, but... I also say don't be so special. Don't be such a specialist that you've painted yourself in such a niche right. corner that you have no opportunity. You really limit the opportunities, right? Yeah. But you don't want to be a generalist where one day you're a sports expert, the next day you're a finance expert, the next day, right? <laughs> right? That's a bit too general. <laughs> Even if you can be knowledge, you can be knowledgeable in those areas. Like I think I'm knowledgeable and I try to be informed on a lot of different topics and stuff. But if you were to say, hey, Danny, what's your concentration? Of I'm, I'm going to be able to hopefully narrow it down, especially depending on who's asking. So even mm -hmm. if you are uh, knowledgeable in so many different arenas and do business in a lot of arenas, you still have to tell us some sort of specialization depending on who that potential client or, or that you're going to work with uh, requires. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And I think there was that nuance wasn't described in the book. Right, right, right. Also, um, you know, I think uh, what I'm, there's more than one way. There's more than one way to be successful in business and there's more than one way to be rich and wealthy and all of that other good stuff. I do think he definitely put a high emphasis on real estate, um, which honestly, yeah, pretty much everyone does. You you can't, you know, the real estate agenda is real. <laughs> you know, like you want to be wealthy, get into real estate. That's a real thing. Uh, yeah. And I think what it does is it puts people in a lot of positions and makes them make certain decisions for the sake of getting into real estate that 
kind of screws them over long term, you know? Yeah. Um, in terms of like, that is one of the things that give you the most, um, kind of, I don't want to call it incremental income, but I guess compound interest, right? Yeah. Isn't that one of the interest. Best, best sources of that. Yeah. Interest, build your wealth, you know, equity and all of that stuff. I get it. I, I'm not here to say it's lies, but it's not the end all be all for, for people that want to get into business. Right. You know, they, they make a big point about knowing how to sell and being a seller. Right. And I totally agree. You have to know how to sell and you know how to be a seller. And mm -hmm. I say that knowing that me personally, I'm not the biggest seller. That's, that's my weak area. Marketing and selling, I know you need to know how to do that or have someone do it for you. You have to know how to pitch yourself. I know how to pitch myself just enough, right? But after I've reached my threshold of this is enough, I don't like to overly sell and overly market my stuff, right? Um, yeah. But I will say another thing that gets neglected in this whole selling and pitching conversation, regardless, not just for this book, but in any industry is everyone's not built for that. And then it also you also have to be mindful of your network and who you can pitch to and how you come across. And I just feel like that's always neglected. It just feels like they just assume like everyone knows a lot of people. Right? And I'm like, people don't know each other like that. A lot of people do not know each other like that. You know, it's like uh, if a lot of people was to just sit and look at their network, right, and see who they could pitch any service or any product to, are, is anyone in their network today viable clients or candidates, right? And if not, so be it. So then you have to start hitting the pavement. You have to start cold calling. You have to start doing outreach efforts to random strangers and stuff like that. And that becomes another task in itself. Well, how are you going to pitch yourself and present yourself to random strangers to gain that trust, to get business and so forth, right? And I think that, to me, that is, I don't know. That just seems to be the biggest miss that not just this book, but a lot of um advice seems to kind of just gloss over, you know, and I, they probably say, well, if you're hungry, you're just going to knock on these doors and do what you need to do and make it happen. Yes. Yes, you can. But every, that's, 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 those are not the normal scenarios. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And then I, I tend to lean the same way you do, where it's like, I don't, I'm not great at selling myself. Sometimes I feel as though the product or the service should sell itself for you, mm -hmm. right? Then what you're delivering mm -hmm. to do most of the work. Mm -hmm. But I understand that's a, you know, that I understand that that is a skill that is necessary in business to develop is, you know, not everyone's going to get a chance to experience your product. So you have to sell it and you got to market to people like that. So I, I get it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And also like how long I, I see that, I see that a lot with people who get into real estate, which is, what this book promotes a lot of, right? I see a lot of friends and, and associates who say, hey, I'm going to get into real estate now. And I'm like, oh, great, congrats, you know? And they, they market and they promote, but I'm always like, hmm, how many people do you know in your circle right now are even in the market to buy something and can't even afford what you have in your inventory? Like, it is a big mismatch, right? And... They spend a lot of months trying to make it happen. And if they don't make a closer deal within the first few months, they already burnt out of the game, right? Um, because how long can you do this without selling, without making a sale, right? Um, so that's another area where I was like, uh, I, I get it. I totally get it for all intents and purposes to sell this book. I get it. But I don't really, I wouldn't really promote that out the gate. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. all right. So we, we've talked about what we didn't like about the book pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um, but so let's, I guess let's start from the beginning, right? What was the first lesson he kind of dropped on us or what's the, he sets the stage by setting up his two dads, right? right. I guess that's context we should get first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he sets up the stage and, and, you know, he talks about his two dads and how one is ultra successful and one is marginally successful and, you know, the different lessons. What I do like, I will say with the rich dad, the rich dad was teaching through lessons, right? He kind of he kind of came off kind of dickish to me. You know? <laughs> are you are you referring to the uh, what was it like the story with the uh, with the candy bar? I think the it was candy bar. It's it just like every story is like, why can't this dude like you know he doesn't have to be such an ass about the lessons, right? Like 
you know, I'm not paying you, but I'm not going to pay you. I'm going to make you get so frustrated to where you want to quit. And then, only then, do I reveal the secret sauce and what the lesson was here. <laughs> right? right, right. But he remembered it. I guess that was the goal, is to make sure he remembered this lesson, I guess. Right, right. And I get it. You know, I will say for even, hmm, there's a lot to be said learning from experiences as opposed to just being learned by somebody telling you what to do, right? So I get that the experiences that they had to experience the stuff. So I totally agree with that. They had to experience to see it in real time because sometimes just being told to do it is not enough. So I totally get that. It just felt like he was always teetering on a on the line of getting he's getting him so frustrated. Now I got now I tell you the lesson, right? <laughs> but, it was fine. That I, I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, that was fine. It kind of set the stage for what the rest of the book was going to be, too. <laughs> exactly. I would have been like, I don't play these games, sir. I'll figure it out somewhere else. Uh, the other thing I did um, uh, like about the book is how they broke down the difference between the business, how businesses uh, work with money and, uh, you know, individuals do it. Whereas, like, you know, most, in, most individuals, or as I, come to say nowadays w-2 workers right how w-2 workers get their money so usually they're mm -hmm. they're taxed first w-2 workers are taxed first by the government and all these other entities and then they have to work with the money they have after to live their life and and make the right of moves accordingly whereas um for most businesses um they get taxed last right they get the money they have to figure out how to what to do with this money, if it's profits, where are you putting the profits into, are you reinvesting it, uh, are you trying to uh, uh, invest in the business to grow more so that by the time you file your taxes, you get taxed at a lower level. Um, it, it sounds, to me, it sounds very simple, but for a lot of people, it's lost on a lot of people, right? On the, That's the, a, a big difference. It's a very... It may, it's a big difference on how people move and how businesses move and how when we see these stories about why businesses only pay a certain amount of taxes or why someone who owns a business is only um, paying a certain percentage. I thought, you know, this book did a, a, a good job of breaking it down in the simplest terms. Yeah. Yeah. So that leads into one of his first pieces of advice is, right, is like pay yourself first, mm -hmm. right? Wasn't that on the list? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which yeah is, is very true and it's you know I had a we hear a lot a lot of times we hear these terms in TV and, and shows and we don't really know what it means oh they just wrote it off they just wrote it off without really knowing what it meant but so this I thought he did a good job of really kind of um, did a good job there you know yeah how about yourself any points that you did like <laughs> instead of <laughs> trashing it out well, today well <laughs> nah, yeah, I mean, I liked, I liked a lot of it. Like, I, for, the, for the record, I do enjoy this book, right? Mm -hmm. The second read, I enjoyed it. The first read, I enjoyed it, too, um, just for different reasons, right? For the first read, I was looking for those literal um, steps and tools to build wealth, right? Mm -hmm. In this, I was kind of, we went into this thinking about the man, <laughs> the author more than anything, at least me, right, based right. on, my, you know, the, mm -hmm. that last conversation we had and right. this controversial statement. So right. I'm really just trying to wrap my head around his mentality when discussing these things mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I still liked it from that perspective. So we talked about pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of touched on like, you know, traditional versus unconventional methods of income. Right. And mm -hmm. like thinking outside the box. So I do appreciate all that stuff. Um, and then what I wanted to ask you and kind of get your opinion on, he talked a lot about, and I don't know if he used this exact wording for it, but like the scarcity mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. that'll lead to poor financial decisions. Mm -hmm. And that that crossed both sides, right? That really stood out to me the first read, and it stood out again to, to me in the second read because I feel like, A, it's good advice, and B, I can see it in everyday action. From, yeah. Not even just myself, from other people. You can see people mm -hmm. making bad financial decisions based on, Fear of income, or fear of losing their job, or fear of you know whatever. There's fear, fear-based right. decisions. So right, right. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to chime in on that. Could you just for the audience give a little bit more insight into that? Sure. Yeah. That? So basically, what Robert was saying, and through his two dads, was that you know there there is the doctor. He used the example of the doctor who is um, losing money, so he raises his rates. Mm -hmm. Well, now the clients they can't afford 
to pay the doctor anymore because the rates went up. So now they're in poorer health, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, he just talks about the trickle down effect mm -hmm. from that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a great way to describe how that fear, this doctor's fear of losing money just really affected this whole infrastructure, right? And it mm -hmm. affected people in his supply chain and in his sales funnel just because mm -hmm. based off a of fear based decision, nothing financially, nothing necessarily financially um, sound told him to raise his rates. And there wasn't necessarily a percentage that was made sense that his customers could handle that wouldn't affect his business, right? It was just mm -hmm. like, shit, I'm losing money. I need more money. We're going to raise our rates. So right. that's right. just it in a nutshell. It's right, making fear based decisions and having it making it poor financial uh, fear based decisions. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I definitely agree. I, I do agree with that. That's another good point because I I can hmm, you know, scarcity mentality is real and it's it's and fear based decisions is very real. And I will say even in twenty twenty four, it's even more prevalent than ever, right? If you if you go on your local LinkedIn, you go on your social media platform, it's it's not it's not hard to be scared, right? If you allow it to, you see how many uh, sad stories about people who've lost their jobs or businesses, and it does put you in a sense of oops, I gotta start making some moves. Even even when you look at your situation, you're nowhere near that state of being or or, or need to be concerned you're still going to start making some decisions because you're scared of the possibility, right? Even if you're not nowhere nowhere near that scenario. So that's a good point. I mean, I can I can speak for myself when I've made some fear-based uh, or scarcity decisions. And I I'm, uh, that might sound a bit harsh, but you know, there's times when in the past you just make certain choices and you're like, "Hmm, in hindsight, did I even need to make that? What What was I so concerned about in the first place? Like those things that I was concerned about, wasn't it wasn't anywhere near close to happening. But I got a little shook. I got a little scared. It's like it might dry up, you know. Especially, especially when you start hitting a stride as well. You start being successful. You start thinking something is gonna lurk around the corner <laughs> and just take it all away. You start, you know what I mean? You start you start making some ridiculous decisions uh, along the way. So, uh, which ultimately actually contributes to, you've, you've sabotaged yourself because you've made these fear-based decisions that's actually doing you more harm than good overall. Yeah, definitely more harm than good. Yeah, mm -hmm. because look at that. He, he crippled his whole, I mean, as a, as a fictional scenario that mm -hmm. he gave, but mm -hmm. he crippled his whole, uh, customer base because they couldn't afford the treatment. The doctor mm -hmm. all because he was scared. So yeah, 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 absolutely. I definitely I don't know. Well, I don't think I've you know I haven't I haven't done anything that has crippled my business, <laughs> my endeavors and stuff like that. But there's definitely been times when I've made certain moves or plays just because of you know a certain fear of what could be when it it was never a real threat or concern at all. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um. So, okay, um, all right, any other points you have that you, you was messing with on this book? Um, uh, we, we touched on it a little bit in the beginning, but access versus liabilities, right? He Absolutely. does a good job of explaining it, and also he has that those charts in the book where he shows you this is where your money's going when you have an asset. This is where your money's going when you have a liability mm -hmm. out the door, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it made it very plain, mm -hmm. very, uh, very easy to grasp, right? So you like... Things that bring in more income are assets, and things that take out your income are liabilities. So. Yeah, yeah, he definitely did a good job of that. I agree as well, and he also did a good job on how, at least, explaining how certain things that have been taught to us that we should list as actual assets are not true assets. Um, I didn't, I didn't disagree with that. You know, I definitely disagree. Some, you know, some things we account for and we may think it's an asset, and it's like, nah. That's still a liability too. Right? It's not generating yeah. income and, and so forth. So I thought he did a good job of that, definitely. Um, which is so crazy because I'm I'm it's not like there was anything in the book that had me say, Oh, you're lying, you you're nonsense. It was just No, not at all. No. Nothing like I that. It, it was might... more so like <laughs> Yeah, had a couple of those moments. Yeah, like, like uh, exactly. What was that, Sean? Was that a sound effect you made? <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what you would call that. Like a skeptical <laughs> sound effect. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. So definitely the lot. I the area where 
I pro this is this isn't I don't think this is a fair based move. It's just me on my comfort level. I'm just not big on leveraging debt. I'm only within the last two years have I been comfortable saying and exploring the ways that debt can be leveraged. But I'm really a debt free at all costs type of person. <laughs> you know That's been your consistent yeah. like if you if, if there was something on your tombstone, God forbid, <laughs> that would be on it. Like debt free. Like, debt free, so. can't no when when I'm when it's all said and done, can no one say I owe them anything. And if there's any right. out, if there's any outstanding bills that need to be paid, my estate is gonna handle it ASAP. ASAP Rocky, <laughs> like as soon as they can, as soon as they can. Uh, but I have been open, I would say, within the last two years to just exploring uh, where that can be leveraged for um, for some benefit, business benefit. But if, if but debt for the sake of personal like endeavors, like a new car or a vacation, I'm not even entertaining that in the least. You know what I mean. Either I can yeah. afford it or I can't. So even though he's given those sound financial, there is a, un, he's given sound financial information and, and, and knowledge, you know, he's definitely big on leveraging that debt, which it ain't really for me. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you feel about, um, he goes into a little bit about the middle class tax, which was another chapter I liked a lot. Oh, personally. yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, I didn't disagree with him. <laughs> I didn't disagree. I think there was obviously we're generalizing again, but hold on, step back, Sean. Since you brought it up, Can explain it, was, it a little yeah, bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, what Robert describes here is the dilemma of the Robin Hood or the or the fallacy of the Robin Hood mentality, where you steal from the rich and give to the poor, right? Mm -hmm. they, basically, how taxation evolved. They're not. It, the taxes are coming from everyone in the middle, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The poor don't necessarily have enough to pay enough taxes to fund and support everything in the government. Mm -hmm. And the rich have these corporations and all these structures built around them to shield them from taxes. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it falls on everybody else in the middle that ends up paying the majority of taxes. That's right. how I interpret it. Right, right. So that's the thing. <clears throat> and this might, I think this is related to my earlier gripe about how he's very, ant he's super capitalist capitalist and then you know goes after everyone else i don't disagree with what he's saying right now this this we might be leaning more outside of business conversation the financial and might be getting more into just overall societal structures right um i don't disagree with what he's saying about who bears the brunt of a lot of this stuff it is the middle but i'm also big on the social contract that we have as, as a society has signed, right? Um, and that contract does change. And, you know, when you participate in a society, you are, to an extent, signing an unofficial contract, right? And there are hierarchies to income and living status and things like that based off the society that you are in. It's not always fair. I'm not for the, at all going to say it's always fair. In fact, there's a lot of, Areas where it's not fair, right? So in his case, yes, the middle class is definitely bearing a lot of the brunt, right? I think mm -hmm. where we might differ is that a lot of times the middle are bearing a lot of the brunt and they turn their frustrations uh, on the group below them as the reason to why they are paying all these issues and taxes, right? Right, like, like yeah, my taxes are paying right. for your welfare and stuff like that, that right. kind of right. mentality, which is not accurate. It's not all, accurate at all, think. right, right. <laughs> it's not accurate. But even if you read that book, even if you read that Rich Dad Poor Dad book, you can see he, he leans towards that perspective as well, right? Uh, just the way how he frames certain things. And with that being said, he, he paints that picture but then he paints another picture, which I thought I actually agree, I agree with as well. But it doesn't seem it didn't seem to hit the streets how everyone else or the other lessons, which is when you are rich and wealthy, it doesn't matter what taxes get implemented or what tax code gets put into play. 
because the rich and uber wealthy are always going to figure out another loophole to preserve their t- their wealth, right? Um, yeah. And mm-hmm. and I was like, well, why doesn't anybody speak on that? It's kind of like no matter how many locks you make, there will be another burglar that will figure out how to break this lock, right? And he speaks on that. And I was like, he's right. It's a good point. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a game of cat and mouse. But why isn't... Hmm. No one seems to blink an eye at that, right? And it's kind of like, hmm. It's a very, it's a, again, like I said, now we're getting more on the lines. We're not just talking about business. We're talking about how society is structured as a whole, right? And also, another thing is, I would think is worth noting is not just the, it's not just the taxes that the middle class is paying. Um, it's also the lifestyle that the middle class is being pushed towards. Right. And he made a yeah. good, he did make a good point about that. Not just the taxes alone, but also the lifestyle that's being promoted. And it's a difference between affluent, wealthy, rich, all those distinctions. And certain people may think they're in a certain class and not really. And they're trying to get to another group or another status. And at what cost? For a lot of them, it is at the cost of debt. <laughs> right. Uh, probably not the same type of debt that, uh, rich dad is doing but it's still debt nonetheless so it starts to become uh an ongoing game and an ongoing cycle of one group trying to reach the next group and the next group trying to reach the next group while being mad at the other group that they are for lack of a better term helping but that's below them and it kind of makes them feel like they can't get to the next group you know what i mean yeah totally yeah yeah <laughs> Over, I, I definitely oversimplified it. I, I'm not an ec- economist by any means or anything like that. But uh, I mean, yeah. you didn't over, oversimplify it any more than he did in the book. So. Right. <laughs> that's a good point. Go over a good point. Um. So yeah, that that that's a good point. I will say another area that I just probably I'm a, we're gonna I'm gonna sound like a hypocrite, especially because of the type of books that I read. I definitely read a lot of self-help books, a lot of finance books. I read a lot of business books. This, and I've read books that get, those type of books that really get deep into it on the self-help and mental and some that very glossy and goes over it. I just felt like with this one, it was very, it was self-help-ish, but it was very surface level. I felt like it was very surface level, self-help-ish type lessons here like it didn't get down to the underlying uh whatever mentality or causes behind some of the things that he's yeah it was just like poor people do this rich people do that middle class people do this Uber, you know what i'm saying uh, sure i guess we got to generalize in some aspects right if not i get it i totally get it but i was like uh this ain't really it but and i think what surprised me as i was rereading it considering how much people love this book and now I'm rereading it. I'm like, well, if people love this book so much, a lot of people that I see who love the book don't seem to be executing based on the book's advice. That was another thing that got to me. Like, hmm, I had to really start thinking about all the people who used to talk heavy about this book and how they move. And I'm like, they don't move how the book kind of tells them they should be moving too. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a lot of what not to do. Don't be this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So I mean, listen. So that's that. So with that being said, I think you know we gave a nice little overview. Our two cents, why we liked it, why we didn't. Even and even you made a good point about separating the author from the actual book. You know, um, I guess in this day and age, and considering what we talk about on our show and so forth, would you recommend this book to a um, to a up and coming person who's trying to get into business and learn about business i would say yes absolutely just mm-hmm. based off of like the first couple of chapters where you're getting out of the mental space of the scarcity mentality and mm-hmm. learning like your assets versus liabilities which you know there's a lot of other books that teach it more uh more in depth right, right. but this is mm-hmm. a good storyline way to do it and a good way to wrap your mind around it visually so yeah, I definitely recommend this book. I think it's still a good book. Whether we um, are a fan of the author in 2024 or not, it's a different story. But no, I think this va- I think this book is real valuable. I think it's going to stand the test of time because of how simplified it is. Mm-hmm. It helps you understand these 
bigger economic concepts and it gives you a good introduction to them on a simple, simplistic, simplistic basic that you can relate to almost your life, right? I feel like everyone kind of has a rich dad, poor dad, or a rich mom, poor dad, mm-hmm. or educated mom, educated dad, however you want to put it in their lives, right? There's always someone who's more frugal, I feel like, out of your parental structures. So I think that's a good introduction. I do, I would recommend this book. Fair enough. Fair enough. I will say, I I, I can acknowledge my own shortcomings in all of this about this book. I probably also felt the way... Uh, because I am an educator as well. And I was like, yo, you coming at me kind of hard in this book, bro. <laughs> like, yo. Bro, he... my dad was a teacher, and I'm just like, you know what? I feel like my dad would agree with you on some of these things. So, I don't know. Like the like some of the some of these things. Right, yeah. right, right. I'm like, I don't feel like, you know, you it, it's easy to get, get caught up in your own feelings. Like, ah, oh, chill, I'm an educator, don't come at me, bro. But I would say, I will say this. You know, when I read it uh the first time around, I probably would not have recommended it re- recommended it to anyone. I probably just would have been like, yeah, I read it. It was cool and, and kept it moving. And, you know, I didn't really think too much of it. And that probably is also because I was on my own journey and path and I was getting knowledge in so many other areas that was probably a little bit more detailed than this. And it did feel, like we said, felt very simple and surface level. And I'm like, for me at the time, I think I was looking for a deeper knowledge at the time, right? Um, and now that I've reread it, I would, I would recommend it. I would probably, I would also give a little caveat though. Like, listen, if you read this, yeah. read it for sure. Read it as a starting point, but maybe do a little bit more deeper knowledge and research on, you know, your specific areas of business that you want to get into and that you want to do, especially if you're not, I mean, honestly, regardless of the arena, but I do think the real estate game has changed tremendously from when this book was first written. So please make sure you're current on all the real estate laws and business uh, transactions. And if you're not in real estate, this book is a good starting point just on how to think about business, but also be specialized in your arena and get more knowledge on your specific area of, of industry that you're trying to enter, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. So yeah, you know, look at look at that. We we can all we can change our mind. It's okay to change our mind after a, a certain amount of years and revisit things. So yeah, I, I would I would recommend this to someone. Absolutely. I and now this is a weird question, but I want your opinion. Would you recommend this book to your son if you had a son? Nah, because I'm gonna teach him myself. <laughs> all right, all right, fair, fair. That's a great answer. That's, okay. that's, the, that's the only reason why not. Like, if I had a child and then a son or a daughter, you know, um, I'm definitely going to, you know, definitely try to instill all the knowledge that I have. But I also, even now, I'm big on and being an educator. It's like, yes, I'm gonna teach you, but I always say, what I say is not law, <laughs> right? Like, I'm teaching you, but there's probably areas where I can be wrong or things that I've taught that you can approve upon, right? And I, I teach that to all my students as it is. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to definitely drop some knowledge into my into my son. But I also know sometimes it's the messenger. Sometimes they just don't want to hear from you, right? You're, you're That's the, valid, your yeah. father can be the most knowledgeable or mother can be the most knowledgeable person and there's nothing that they did wrong it's just that you're not tuned in to listen to what they have to say. So I'm definitely going to have to throw some books their way as well or probably put them in a class or something that's literally going to tell them exactly what I'm already telling them in the living room. But because they are in a classroom and someone else with a different authority is saying it, it, it resonates a bit more. So, yeah. And you know what? They even talk about in the book learning through osmosis. So mm-hmm. some of that's going to happen too, probably. You know, all the stuff you said will seep into their brains. And then when they get in class, they're going to know the answers, not knowing how they knew it. So. As- absolutely. I'm going to just tell this one, one little story and that speaks directly to this. Every, when, every semester, I try to get a guest speaker to come into my class. Every semester. And, uh, you know, usually I have them come towards the middle, like after midterms and stuff like that. And they just speak and, you know. I, I, I'm no exaggeration. These speakers literally say the exact same thing that I've been teaching these years all semester. Same stuff, same message, same concept. Nothing is necessarily new. And I see how 
now it picks up for them and now it resonates and now they are super engaged, you know, and I just, I, I don't take, feel no type of way. I'm very aware that sometimes you just got to change up the messenger in the, in the situation. So, uh, yeah. So I would give my okay. son, the, yeah, I would teach my son or daughter, but they probably would still need some additional insight. Back to you, Sean, would you? Yeah, no, I would. I feel like, yeah, like I said, I think it's a good intro. I think it's a good intro. Okay, I fair would. enough. Fair enough. Yeah, definitely a good intro. I, I wouldn't knock, knock anyone for reading this book at this point. Um, so, yeah, okay, good deal. All right, this was a good one. I enjoyed this. This is a, this is a good one. We've, 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 um, this, is, this is one of the classics in the, in the business game, so, yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's a wrap on this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed our review and thoughts on this book. Hopefully it provided you with some value and inspiration as you navigate through your business journey in life. As always, if you have a question you would like us to answer on the show, shoot us a message on any of our social media channels. Also, don't forget to subscribe and share on Spotify and iTunes. See you again soon. In the meantime, keep grinding. The Business Grind is for entertainment purposes. Opinions expressed are those solely of the host and guests. Please consult with a professional and exercise discretion before engaging in any business endeavors. I'm out here on the grind. I'm out here on the grind.